Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Zoom faculty roundtable um, related to the scholar strike. Um, we are gathering a wonderful group of people who are teachers at Phillips Theological Seminary who were able to find some free time on their schedule on very short notice. Um, we may be joined by one additional uh, teaching faculty member um, in a moment. But for right now, I wonder if folks would be willing to briefly introduce themselves. Um, since I'm already on the screen, I'll say I'm Sarah Maurice Brubaker, Associate Professor of Theology, um, and I've been at Phillips since 2009. Let's see. Um, since Lee and Susanna are the people who aren't muted at the moment, <laughs> uh, Dean Butler, would you mind introducing yourself? Hello to everyone. I am Lee H. Butler, Jr. I am the Vice President of Academic Affairs and Academic Dean, also the William Tabernay Professor of the History of Religions and Africana Pastoral Theology here at Phillips Theological Seminary. All right, thank you. Um, just going by the gallery view at the top of my screen, um, if you don't mind, we'll go left to right. Uh, Yuki Schwartz, would you mind saying a word about yourself? Hey, hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Yuki Schwartz, and I am, uh, my pronouns are she and they, and I am coming, I'm joining this meeting from occupied Suquamish territory um, known as Washington State. Um, I am a Phillips uh, graduate. I got my MDiv at Phillips in in 2010, and I am currently an adjunct faculty teaching in the theology and the so theology social justice master's program. And I'm also an associate pastor at Keystone uh, Congregational UCC in Seattle. Thank you. Um, and next, Dr. Annie Lockhart Gilroy. Hello, I am Annie Lockhart Gilroy, Assistant Professor of Christian Education and Practical Theology, starting my third year here at Phillips. Thank you. Um, Dr. Arthur Carter would be next if we're reading left to right. Greetings. I am Dr. <laughs> Arthur Carter. I am Assistant Professor of New Testament and Early Christian Literature here at Phillips Theological Seminary. I'm also the director of our Black Church Traditions and African American Faith Life Program, which we are launching this year. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. Reverend Susanna Southard. Hi, I'm uh, Reverend Susanna Southard. I've been on the faculty at Phillips since uh, 2007. Um, Phillips is located on land uh, that is uh, belongs to Cherokee nations, and um, my home is in Creek Territory, Muscogee Creek, and all of it was at one time Osage, so uh, we have lots of heritage, um, and my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I've borne um, several different titles at Phillips, but let me just say that I oversee the worship life as chaplain, and also um, I teach mostly introductory level courses in practices of ministry and theological reflection. Thanks. And then um, I think last but not least, at least for now, uh, Reverend Shonda Ja. Hey, I'm Shonda. I'm the director of the Oakland Peace Center out in Oakland, California, uh, engaged in labor organizing, anti-racism work for the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, um, and also adjunct faculty here at Phillips, in, uh, along with Yuki with the Masters of Social Justice. Thank you all. <clears throat> um, so since we're putting this together mainly for the wider Phillips community, um, and since it came together so quickly that we didn't have a lot of time to come up with a set of questions amongst ourselves, um, I put out the appeal for crowdsourced questions. 
Um, and I got a number of very thoughtful ones. And as you might expect, some of them were quite similar. So I'd like to start um, <clears throat> by noting that a lot of the questions um, were concerned, came from, from folks who identified as white and who were concerned about um, being good allies and talking about strategies and getting strategies for being better allies. And um, when we on this call were discussing the questions that had come in, uh, one thing that came up for discussion was the problematic framing of um, we want to be allies that assumes that folks in the room, as Dr. Lockhart Gilroy put it, um, are, are not the people affected by racialized violence, but are the people who are seeking to be allies to the people affected by racialized violence. Um, and so as, as one of the two white folks on the call, with Reverend Other being the other, um, maybe we could just for a moment um, share briefly about that and then pivot back to what the scholar strike is supposed to be about, which is actually centering, um, centering the people who have not been centered because academic spaces center whiteness so much. So we'll have the, the brief moment of, of centering in order to, to decenter. Um, so um, yeah, Susanna, uh, would you be willing to talk about that? Um, just briefly in your own perspective of as a white person who enters racial, I know you do a lot of racial justice conversation in the wider Tulsa community. What have you noticed about uh, frameworks that say racial justice is about what we can do to be allies? Um, what I want to say is mostly that uh, people who look like me need to learn how to be quiet. So <laughs> I'm, not, I'm choosing not to go first on this. Okay, okay. Um, sounds good. Then would you... Um, hmm. Okay. Um, I'll just say, no, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. I'll just say that I think um, from my own experience, those kind of questions are, based, are best handled in white caucusing conversations and not, um, not in gathered groups like this. So like you, I will also defer and, but I also wanna maybe put out an offer for uh, folks who might be listening to this who would be interested in a white caucus to, to have those, how can we who benefit from white supremacy um, be better allies, but we probably will defer that from this call specifically. So, okay, great. Then um, I'd like to invite Dr. Carter and Dean Butler to talk a little bit about uh, how one defines racism, because of course there are uh, many different operating definitions and as Dr. Carter pointed out in our preliminary conversation, it matters a great deal which one you're using. Yes, uh, thank you. I have a, a starting point when discussing or thinking about theorizing race. And my starting point is this, because race is a construct, it's been a constructed idea, it is a modern uh, construct. Um, anytime we're talking about race, we're always talking about racism because it is a construct that was developed to stratify the human experience and to bring about segregation. And so any conversation about race, any discussion about race is automatically a discussion about racism. That's, that's my starting point. And uh, in my second book, I developed uh, a definition of racism that uh, I've come to uh, understand 
through my research that says racism is a regenerative system of victimization which justifies, multiplies, and diversifies itself. It's a system that denigrates, subjugates, and annihilates the undesirable in the name of religion. It's a destructive, life-denying system predicated on the issues of identity and survival. Racism is the oppressive force that devours the divinely created human image. Therefore, racism is fundamentally a theological issue. So, you know, if we had time to only talk about this, I would break down each part. But if you're just grabbing the pieces and, and recognizing that racism is something that uh, seeks to maintain its own life. Uh, if, if you push it in one direction, it pops out in another area. It, it, it reconstructs itself so that it does not die very easily. And so you have someone like William Jones who said that racism is a virus that mutates. And so... Um, that, that's my basic operational definition and understanding of racism. And so that will uh, inform you as to how I answer and engage questions about race and racism. Dr. Carter. And I appreciate that uh, framework of, of engaging this notion of racism by explicitly stating that racism is both oppressive, but it is also fundamentally theological. And so often individuals want to uh, detach race from the, the various social institutions and structures which buttress and hold it up. And one of the reasons that this is important for me is because as a, as a biblical scholar, people have been interpreting and reading the same text for thousands of years. And one of the reasons that people frequently come to different conclusions is because they're bringing different experiences, different definitions, different presumptions and assumptions to the text when they're reading. And it's much the same way when we're talking about race and racism. And so often we end up exchanging ideas um, about what is race, what is racism, what is just, what is not, what is unjust. And at the heart of these exchange of ideas, we can't actually have uh, valuable conversation across across uh, boundaries because individuals don't actually think about developing and laying out their own notions of what race is and then what racism is. Um, because in the United States, um, race has become a construct so intimately tied to skin color and complexion that some individuals think that race is biological, it is self-evident, it obviously exists. Whereas when we're thinking about race itself, race is a social construct, as Dean Butler just said. And so when we look at the complicated history of the United States, different groups have been able to move in and out of whiteness, in and out of blackness, in and out of racial and ethnic categories. And so a lot of times you're speaking, we're speaking with individuals, having conversations with individuals that think that race is something that is coded in the DNA. And that just isn't necessarily the case because your race can change um, throughout history, throughout the American history, based on going across state lines or going across um, boundaries. And so we're then thinking about what is race. Race, and the definition that I use when I'm talking about race is, race is a social construct that draws on both um, somatic and, and bodily features right, that are culturally situated. So each society decides what physical features to hone in on. And then they signify, they interpret those features as being relevant to categorize and classify individuals into different groupings. And so for some places, it would be hair. Some places, it would be skin complexion. Some places, it would be ears. Some people, it would be nose, lips, hips. Um, and then frequently, 
it is not one specific body type, but it is a combination of all of these different things that each society decides, this is what we're going to use to, to signify and to classify individuals. But then the thing is, it's not just the signification on the body, but is also engaged in these notions of signifying on history and narrative. So for individuals that say that they are from somewhere, then that works alongside how the body is racialized. And so it becomes not just something that's genetic, but something that's also narrative, something that's also historiographic. And that is the complicated way in which different communities and societies develop these notions of race. And so then when we're moving from these notions of biological race to race as social construct, we can then move to the reality that lots of people have different definitions of racism. Racism for many individuals, um, is simply lynching someone or using a pejorative racial epithet. And so for them, racism is having a bad opinion or a derogatory hostile attitude towards someone. However, when we look at the history of racialized people in America, the words are not the most harmful thing that have taken people's life, caused people to be unreasonably hostile, hateful, and in fear for their lives. And so using a limited, restricted attitude of definition of racism really cuts off the conversation because people can stop using the N-word and continue to kill, lynch, and not hire. And so we have to understand that individuals then develop notions of racism, where racism deals with power structures, the categorization of individuals, and the construction of one racial group over the other, and using these things to maintain itself. So where we're going from critical race theory or we're going to in notions of individual racism, the question then has to be engaged. How are we conceiving racism before we begin these conversations? Because if we're not, we're only talking to ourselves. Thank you both. Um, the next question on our docket has to do with the difference between intent and impact. Um, the question that was received, which we can springboard off of in any direction that our uh, panelists like, um, is as follows. It's become a standard trope in racial justice circles that intent is different from impact. Just because someone didn't intend an action to be racist, the impact might still have been racist. And the question was, which we can also defer to a caucus conversation. Um, what are some ways that white liberal Christianity brings about racist impact even when the intention might not have been racist? Um, but more broadly, because that is more of a white caucus question, um, talk to us about uh, intent and impact, um, Reverend Southerd and Dr. Lockhart Gilroy, and thank you. And just as a time note, I know that Reverend Ja has to leave in 15 minutes, so we need to leave some time for her as well. I'll, I'll try to raise a few things quickly uh, and say just in my own uh, journey, um, I first learned the distinction between intent and impact at a very personal level and thought of it in terms of how to deal with my own racist behavior. And it's really been over time and then it's solidified with the asking of that question what does institutionalized intent versus institutionalized impact mean? And so the first thing that came to my mind was um, Indian boarding schools. Mm -hmm. Having grown up in Kansas within you know, a few miles of the Shawnee Indian Mission that was founded by a Methodist preacher, and I happened to be United Methodist, so it was a great source of pride to me to know that there was this mission that had been started in an effort to help provide a uh, assimilation opportunities for native children and it's and over the years of course I have learned oh no those boarding schools had huge impact that was incredibly um, racist and violent uh, in those ways so I, I just offer that as as an institutional way in which intent and impact um, don't match and the intent does not um, eradicate the harm that has been done and continues to be done as we are just now beginning to think about Many of us, sorry, I keep speaking for my whiteness, uh, are just beginning to think about these schools. Let me also say um, that the first trip that uh, uh, 
Sarah, you and I took with students to um, Ferguson uh, was a huge moment for me to learn again about the notion of impact and how white, well-meaning liberal Christians, right, walk into a situation, assume that we're welcome, that our leadership is, you know, needed, that we can leverage our white power, our white privilege to, you know, assist other people. And we, re we learned very quickly and repeatedly throughout that week, no, 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 go to spaces where you're invited and do only those things that you are invited to do. Uh, don't, don't, the whole white savior complex is a problem mm -hmm. and it's theologically based and it's about intent versus impact. That's all I need to say. And in my piggyback on that, I would also push back a little bit and challenge the premise of the question. Because um, when I think about the systemic nature of racism um, and how it just permeates so much of our thinking and, and those who, you know, those formed within these, you know, very racist constructs. Um, I sometimes think that the intent may be benevolent, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's not racist, right? Um, you may not have chosen, you know, that is not, that may not be your desire, <laughs> right? Um, you know, I mean, because even the example of Indian boarding schools, that is inherently racist. The idea that you're going to civilize a people, right? Um, you know, that's, that's inherently racist. Um, the idea of a white savior, benevolent, right? The, the intent, I would still argue, is still has, you know, is racist. So while one does not mean to be that way, I would say step back and think about the systemic nature, step back and think about exactly what you're saying that you're doing and why you're saying that you are doing it. The additional thing that I wanna say is for the group person that is impacted, it is not their job to deal with intent. It is not their job to carry that emotional burden and decide whether you meant harm or good. Right, that's that's the person doing the thing. That's 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 their job to do. Um, it is it is one's job who is who is who is I would say the victim of this impact to deal and heal first um, and possibly call out the harm. Um, but I think that too often people want to rush to, but I didn't mean it, therefore you need to do the emotional work of cutting me a break. And I don't think that is the job of the one that is receiving um, the, the racist impact. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Reverend Ja, um, you are a very um, skilled community organizer. And I know from what I, um, from, from how beloved you are by our students that you're very good at teaching community organizing as well. Um, what, what ways have you found uh, to be helpful thinking about how to organize for racial justice um, and even sometimes try to persuade people to invest in resistance movements without centering whiteness and say like the real, the real focus for racial justice should be bringing white people around. So let's focus everybody's energy on white people. So I really appreciate that question. And I think that it was based on one of your crowdsourced questions, right? It was, About... yeah. Would you, did you want me to read that yeah, one? Yeah, why not? Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. um, here it and is. And connect, what you said was an ex is the perfect framing of it, yeah. Oh, well, good. Um, how does, this is the crowdsourced question, um, condensed for brevity. How does racial justice require a redefinition of what is commonly seen as good? For example, for white Christians, silence has often been moralized as good, as in good people don't talk about these things. So how might one change that understanding of goodness 
so that white Christian support for resistance movements becomes possible. Right now, it seems like many white Christians aren't demanding the impossible. Oh, sorry, excuse me. Many white Christians are demanding the impossible of resistance movements. They're saying to resistance movements, yeah. go ahead and bring widespread change, but do it in a nice, quiet, orderly way. Yeah. Um, which, and I love that question also because uh, for those of us who have been doing nonviolent resistance work actively for two decades um, with very slow, limited change, um, it is hilarious to me uh, to hear people shaming, uh, shaming folks for being angry. Um, and and I am fascinated by that because the people who are doing the shaming were not part of the nonviolent resistance work that I was a part of for the past 20 years. Uh, so I love the question, I love your framing, but I love the question about um, how do we reinvent this category of the good person? Because I think it ties very much to what Dr. Lockhart Gilroy was just talking about and Reverend Southard in the, they're saying when you are dealing with issues that are systemic, to boil this down to the individual, which gets back to what Dr. Carter and Dr. Butler were talking about, Dean Butler were talking about, as far as understanding racism and how it was constructed uniquely on this soil, right? It's what, um, uh, it's what the book, The Underground Railroad, refers to as stolen labor on stolen land, right? The foundations of this nation. Um, and since we're a theological group, I think it's important to recognize that that notion of the good person versus the bad person is, is shaped very much and very uniquely in this country by one of its original sins, which is the sin of individualism, right? The construct of individualism, which goes against the nature of all of our ancestors, all of them regardless, regardless of our ethnic background. And so I think we have this unique opportunity to reconstruct what goodness is relative to community. And I know that you all have talked about this a ton at Phillips and everybody already knows the origins of the scholar strike, but if you'll forgive me for just briefly quoting uh, Dr. Anthea Butler and Kevin Gannon, who wrote why they, they helped launch this. Um, its origins, as you know, were the, the basketball uh, strike, right? The withholding of labor as an intentional act of bringing attention to the radical injustices, the historic injustices. Um, and so they said, that was the beginning of the scholar strike, a movement designed to bring recognition to the mounting numbers of deaths of African Americans and others by excessive use of violence and force by police. Scholar strike is a two-day action on September 8th and 9th, where professors, staff, students, and even administrators will step away from their regular duties and classes to engage in teach-ins about racial injustice in America, policing, and racism in America. And the reason I wanted to mention that was because in the academy, sometimes it's so saturated with that historic context of whiteness, that historic sin of individualism, that even when we're doing that work, it can be easy to forget. This is to talk about police violence against black and brown bodies. Um, and this is not an abstraction. This is not a theoretical thing. This is family and friends and the people on this screen's daily existence. And the fact that that can get turned into an abstraction in the classroom, including when people of color are at the front of the classroom, is part of the profound violence that upholds this nation. I wanted to mention that just because I am on occupied Ohlone land and I am also on the land of Oscar Grant. I am also on the land of Eric Salgado, who was murdered by California Highway Patrol two months ago, a mile from where I'm sitting, and who the police still haven't said what happened, despite dozens of witnesses, despite the fact that it was the fourth such police-related killing in the eight years I've been living in this neighborhood. Um, it's a daily reality that doesn't get the dominance that it deserves. And so we have this opportunity, right? If we're talking about goodness, to understand it in the context of community, 
to understand it in the context of what it means to be in relationship to each other. If we take seriously the notion of family, I went to seminary in Chicago. I went to seminary on the south side of Chicago, and I know for a fact that the University of Chicago Police Department is the second largest private police force in the world after the Vatican, and that while the university itself holds land that covers maybe a square mile, the policing radius of the University of Chicago Police is 10 miles of the south side of Chicago. And if we understand ourselves as family, if we understand ourselves theologically to be neighbors, what it means to be good people is to recognize our impact on our neighbors, to in understand our impact on our family, to understand our opportunity to engage. If this does happen to be a conversation that's happening mostly with white students, y'all join the Collect Your Cousins campaign that showing up for racial justice is running. It is an opportunity for white folks to talk with white folks about stopping fascism. It's a chance for white folks to talk with the white folks that aren't getting paid attention to by the Democratic Party or the mainstream of the Republican Party who are only getting talked to by the radicalized white supremacist right. You have a chance to be good. Take this opportunity to do it. Thank you, Reverend Jaw. And um, knowing that you have to leave for a staff meeting, we'll all wave you, wave you goodbye and wish you well. And thank you for making this time. Um, particularly I really look since- I to listening to the rest of the conversation yes. as it's recorded, because I can't wait yes. to see what comes next. <laughs> well, and speaking of what comes next, Dr. Schwartz. <laughs> um, you are another beloved teacher in the MASJ program um, with a lot of insight. I know, I know more about your dissertation topic than maybe some people do, but I'll resist the urge to fangirl about it, um, but I love it. But, <laughs> um, but I know you know a lot of, um, you've done a lot of good thinking about religion and politics. And so would you talk about one of the crowdsourced questions, which was, how should we be thinking about the intersection of religion and politics? When is it terrifying and dangerous? And when is it necessary for the movement of the gospel and justice? And I'll mention that the asker of this question shared that they are, quote, on a mission to stop the notion that politics can't be discussed in religious settings. I'm, hang on, I'm gonna bring this up, the question up, because I want to make sure I get to every important, juicy little bit of it. <laughs> so, so I, I struggle often. Um, and one of the first things that I do in the class is I, I want to break that binary of religion and politics. And I think part of the, the struggle that we have in the United States is um, the word politics gets related to partisan. And so we have a difficulty of thinking about politics outside of partisan politics. The very strange, unique way that we do our, our government in, you know, in the United States, when actually politics is about how we live together as a people. And how we live together as a people are, is, has always been grounded upon issues of power, issues of authority, issues of sharing, and abundance, um, issues of who is included in community and who is not, who is awarded the blessings of security and food and shelter and dignity and who is not. And so, and so theology too is grounded upon all of these things. Who are we as a people? Who is included in this thing that we call beloved community? Who will we share our meals with? Who do we protect? Who do we love? And so, um, but the other aspect too, I think that is, is a problem in US uh, faith life, especially US Christianity, but also, well, let me, let me back that up, US white Christianity, um, but also as a, as a consequence of US Christian imperialism is that we have 
we believe that our faith life is private and personal um, without giving any thought about how blurry that boundary between private and public is and also how much the private parts get denied to people because of racism and because of, of uh, colonial, colonization and imperialism. Because people of color do not have the right to a private life. And we see that in policies and we see that in policing. Um, we see that, um, that the intent for people of color does not match any impact um, that they either make or that they received. It's wildly out of proportion. And so what we have to do is get rid of this notion that, that our private spheres and our public spheres are fundamentally separate and that we can build that wall around, we can build that wall around our personal and private faith lives. And there are many, there are many Christians in the United States, mostly out of communities of color who do not have that, that division between faith life and public life or private life and public life. It is, it is in that same area. And so as we, um, as we bring, it, it's necessary to talk about our politics because we are talking about that fundamental question of who belongs and who will we protect and who will we not. Thank you so much. Um, that's the end of the crowdsourced questions or um, consolidated crowdsourced questions. Um, would any of you all like to share some more before the Dean closes us out? Has it sparked anything or anything that you meant to say but, but uh, didn't get the chance? One of the, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the parts of the conversation that's going on across America and the kinds of issues that are being raised around religion and politics. Uh, I had myself a really good laugh the other day when I looked at something someone was saying, uh, and they were saying it as though this is a brand new understanding. It's a brand new approach. And I, I laughed, like I said, you know, 50 years ago, James Cone was saying this, and he was just put way down this notion about religion and politics and that white Christianity really must take seriously, take seriously what it is doing and what it has not done in terms of justice to, since the language you already brought in, justice to the whole family. Uh, and, and, and so uh, it's just interesting to me how now it's come around in a way to say, oh, this is something so important that we must do because of who's speaking it. I'd like to also um, raise one of uh, Reverend Jaw's uh, points about the individualism in, in, in within the United States. And I also think that it's something that introduces a hesitation because people, um, we like to have control. We like to have power. Um, and we like to engage in things that we can control the outcome. And so when individuals develop very individualistic notions of racism, they want to know what they can do to fix it on their own. And what, what then also happens is they don't recognize the socially constructed power systems that we carry with us every single day with all of our words, all of our interactions. When we're engaging our various intersectional identities, we're carrying power, privilege, and some good and some bad. And so, it, so this question of intent and impact, you're at times, like with, with Dr. Lockhart Gilroy said, the intent doesn't matter because your actions are wielding the power of a socially, historically constructed system. And so 
frequently the issue that we really need to try to convince individuals to understand is when they're acting on their own, when they're acting in their individuality and they're constructing their intent in their own mind, that they're not working on their own. They are carrying with them the legacy, the heritage, the power of a system. And these individual notions of race, it really helped, they, 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 they distort people's view of how they're working and what weapons and tools are in their hands and their mouths and in their voting apparatuses. And so that's one of the things that in, in, when we're thinking about religion is, is understanding what we're carrying with us. And because if we can begin to understand and realize who's with us and what's with us, we might then be able to understand what's actually going and how individuals are impacted in ways that the majority culture uh, attempts to uh, undermine or discredit with um, mm -hmm. fake numbers or uh, uh, disingenuous statistics. Um, and so that's one of the aspects that, that um, it really continues to, to hit me, you know, in terms of individuals think that what I do and what I intend to do is all that matters. <laughs> um, as if they're not coming with a society alongside them. And it's that coming with society alongside me. Uh, you remind me of what happened in the New York Park a couple of months ago. Uh, the bird watcher and the, the dog walker and what she uh, weaponized at that moment. And I mean, it came naturally to her. I'm going to call the police and tell them that a black man is threatening my life. And it just came so naturally to her. And had that not been recorded, whose word would have been believed? And she already knew that the power, the institutional power was on her side to actualize those words in that moment. I'd like to piggyback on that a little bit. Um, and also hearing what Yuki said, but still speaking a little partisan um, um, because of the, the audience at Phillips. It was interesting to me that there was some exploration of that woman's politics, right? Um, and seen as liberal and progressive and people were just shocked, shocked, <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, just surprised that someone who was politically liberal um, could, could do that and have that racist intention. Um, and one of the things in which I think we need to realize is looking at, um, just looking at, again, how big and systemic this is. Um, because not only was I not shocked, I actually assumed it. Um, mostly because of the area of New York, um, right, and where, where it happened, but, but it was my assumption. Um, so I say all of that to say that we are too quick to say racism belongs to a particular group of white people that have a particular faith, that go to a particular church, that vote a particular way, um, and all of those particularities equals not me, right? Um, and then, you know, when I heard one of the people that was at Charlottesville with tiki torch in hand, um, yelling things that I will not repeat, say, I'm not a racist, then that's when I knew I had absolutely knew I had no idea who was, right? <laughs> because no one claims that. Um, but there is the, that one then needs to think about being raised, being framed, being formed um, in a racist structure. 
and how that lives within everyone. And as Dr. Carter so wonderfully said, the things that we carry. And I, I want to add too that, that we are talking about creating worlds with, you know, creating worlds with God and with this, you know, and who we understand God to be. And that is dangerous and terrifying getting back to the original question of, of we think we know what the world is and we also think the world is separate from us. But as Dr. Lockhart and Dean Butler and Dr. Carter have all said, the, we carry worlds within us. And in, we really have to get down to that foundation of what, how this world got built by us to include um, to include only some people and not others. And we have to be honest about that. And we have to, we have to face that shame. So of, and, 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 you know, getting back to Sarah's fangirling, that's my dissertation topic on productive shame of how do we engage shame in order to um, really face these sins of colonialism, imperialism, genocide, slavery, everything that we, that because of shame, we try to keep quiet. But don't we want that world to end? <laughs> yes, it's dangerous and terrifying, but we, we are in a faith that tells us to believe in resurrection. So can we, can we lean on that? Um, the last question is, is for Dean Butler um, to kind of take us out. Somebody had asked a specific question about Phillips's institutional commitments. So I'll share that, but also invite the Dean to talk um, about the specific issue raised in the question, but also your vision more broadly going forward, understanding that you only just got here. <laughs> and um, so, uh, the question is um, from, this is a crowdsourced one, on an institutional level, what has the institution of Phillips Seminary learned in the past six months and how will it affect the seminary's institutional life going forward, particularly regarding the hiring and retention of faculty and staff of color? So um, I'll hand it over to you and mute myself. Uh, thank you. Well, as you already uh, identified, uh, the question is asking about uh, what we've learned over the last six months here at Phillips. And I can't speak to what's been learned over the last six months because I'm only in my third month as the academic dean here. So I'm still uh, brand new. Um, but what I will say First, uh, when I started day one, I encouraged uh, the institution, not just the faculty, but the entire Phillips institution to embrace <clears throat> a theme for this academic year that is emerging out of the new national awareness and the protest. And the theme that I encouraged is Jesus and the disinherited ministry responses to violence and oppression so that we will be working as an entire community to address the issues of racial justice, the issues of all manner of violence and the oppression that uh, is very much present within the American psyche, that we become an intentional theological community to explore these issues and to educate our students to engage more effectively these issues in the context of their ministries, wherever their ministries take them. And so uh, in the broader sense, I think it's also important to say that Phillips has made a decision, um, which is a part of how I come to be here, I believe. Phillips has made a decision to be more intentionally diverse as a theological community. 
to extend uh, our diversity of faculty, of students, of staff to be a more intentional community that is more aware of and, and more concerned about uh, the issues that have um, had an impact on the nation and have been um, imposed by the nation, the pain that has been imposed by the nation. And so um, it hasn't been stated uh, broadly, uh, widely, but that commitment to being a more diverse community and how I come to be here is that I am the first African-American uh, academic dean here. Because I come in as a full professor with tenure in the 114 year history of this school, I am the first fully tenured full professor of this institution. And so a profound statement was made moving out of the commitment, I will say, that they were putting, um, using the uh, adage, you know, money where the mouth is, but living into the commitment to bring about radical change within folks. And so uh, inviting me to come in and knowing the kinds of commitments that I have had that I will then maintain here at Phillips, it means that in our hiring, we will be more intentional. It means that in our uh, course development, which is really framing our commitment, our curriculum, we will be more intentional to bring more diversity to the work that we're doing, which is saying that we are now more open to educating everyone. So not only are we inviting the uh, diversity of racial and ethnic, we are saying that uh, our historic uh, dominant communities are now being uh, educated to be more socially conscious and engaged in this work of, of, of addressing the human family. So, and so um, we, we are working to do more and working to live out of our stated commitments. And, and we will continue to do this uh, going into the future. Um, that is my commitment and, and I have this commitment with the support of an institution that previously made the commitment. And so we will do this work together. And part of that work will include uh, doing more work uh, this academic year and in the spring related to specifically the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa massacre, where we are really going to do some big things to make our commitments known and to do that work of education, uh, of theological education, because as I said in my definition of racism, it's a theological issue. And so we are doing our part to educate not only Tulsa, but this nation. That's our commitment, that's my commitment. And so it's back to you. Thank you all so much for um, making time for this on such a short notice. Um, what I understand from Kurt Gortney is that uh, the next step is to send that to him and he'll do some previewing and editing and it should be shared um, through seminary channels shortly. So thank you. And since I'm the Zoom host, I will uh, close out our call unless anyone has a last, last word. Uh, let's leave it. Let's leave it on the Dean's call. Okay, thank you everyone. Take care. <laughs>